A uh, very warm welcome to today's webinar organized by the Norwegian Business Association in Singapore in partnership with Antler and supported by Innovation Norway. My name is Leonas Donas and I'm the Managing Director of NHST Media Group in Asia and President of the Norwegian Business Association in Singapore. We will today aim to uncover the challenges and opportunities during a time of crisis with a special focus on how entrepreneurship and venture capitalism will be impacted and try to uncover what the world order would look like for entrepreneurs and startups and venture capitalists possible uh, after the, the, the COVID-19. Before we start, I have to highlight the truly global participation we have today. We are gathered as a global tribe with a lot in common as we are all affected by the COVID-19 one way or another. We have today participation from Singapore, in Norway, from uh, Kristiansand to the far north of Tromsø, United Kingdom and the great city of London, Australia, Sydney and Melbourne, India, Denmark, France uh, in Paris, Cyprus, Indonesia, in, from the Americas, we have participants from Texas and California. In Japan, we have from, uh, participants from Tokyo, in Africa and Kenya, Thailand, Colombia, Germany, Bahrain, and from the Philippines. So it's a truly global participation and it shows that the topic is aligned to everyone's problems and desires to find a, a way out of this uh, tunnel. Thank you all for joining. You will have options to ask a question as we are moving this discussion forward. So let's uh, switch gear and get going. Magnus Grimelan is the CEO of Antler. Lisa Eknell is a partner at Antler. And Paul Kastman is director of Innovation Norway in Singapore. I have given both of them a, a tight time frame of one minute each to explain in brief who they are and what they're doing. And from there onwards, we will move on to, to uh, the questions and the discussions. So Magnus, you go first, then Lisa and uh, Paul. Great. Hey, um, terrific to meet you all. Um, obviously, uh, profound times and, uh, you know, a defining moment of our generation. I think the, uh, the human toll and the economic toll of uh, the current crisis uh, is reverberating all across the globe and uh, excited to kind of address this from an entrepreneurial perspective. Uh, but I hope everyone is, is healthy and safe. Uh, my background quickly come from Norway originally. Uh, started my career in the military, started at Harvard, then worked at McKinsey for many years, came to Southeast Asia to build Solora.com, which is the biggest fashion e-commerce company here that we then later sold. And uh, since then we've been building Antler, and in Antler uh, we support uh, exceptional individuals uh, to build new companies from scratch around solving real problems. Uh, and uh, we both kind of support them with, with talent, with uh, business model optimization, but also with uh, the first bit of capital. So we are also a venture capital company, early stage venture capital company. Thank you. Thank you, Magnus. Then uh, uh, Lisa. Thank you. So my name is Lisa Enkel. I'm originally from Sweden, south of Sweden. Um, I spent the last decade working and, and founding startups. So moved out from, from Sweden spent three years in San Francisco, Silicon Valley, working for tech companies there. Um, and then I've also spent some time here in Singapore. I'm based here in Singapore and Southeast Asia. I've um, I had a life plan of living in 10 different countries. I came to about four, living in Indonesia, Germany, India, and now kind of got stuck in, in here in Singapore, um, being part of building Antler more or less from day one. And I have two young sons who I hope will not interact uh, today. Um, in addition to building Antler and investing in, in the founders um, we work with, I've also have nearly 10, 10 years of experience of angel investing and backing founders from all over the world. So my background is very much the very early stage of startup life. Thank you, Lisa. And uh, Paul? Thank you, uh, Leo. Um, well, my name is uh, Paul Kastman. I, I work as the director for um, Innovation Norway. I also sit on the board of uh, NBUS together with Magnus, um, as well as the board of Nordic Innovation House. 
Uh, I've been here for approximately two years now. Um, I have a sort of a varied background from Asia. Uh, I used to live and study in, in um, China in the 90s. And I also lived there from 2007 to 2015. So basically through the financial crisis and also the uh, bilateral breakdown between Norway and, and China in the uh, mid uh, 2010s. Um, but it was um, a very interesting time. I worked for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as well as the um, as, as well as Innovation Norway. Uh, I also spent some time in uh, Nepal working for the uh, International Labour Organization on uh, labour migration and corporate social responsibility. Um, I have a background from uh, LSE uh, as well as the University of Oslo and BAE uh, and a particular interest in, in Asia which is why I'm back in Asia now uh, and I'm going to be here for a couple more years. Thank you Paul. Great. So the way we want to move this forward is, is as interactive as possible. And uh, you have obviously the option to ask questions as we are moving this uh, discussion forward. So I, I will kick it off a bit. I had a conversation with Magnus a week prior to the close down and circuit breaker in Singapore with the coffee and a high five. And after that, our lives changed. And we talked about the horrific market conditions that were unfolding. Marcus bro uh, Magnus uh, brought up an analogy. A soldier is shot, wounded, bloodied, and laying or collapsed on the ground. What would you say to the soldier to possibly ignite some glimmer of hope in his eyes? Magnus, uh, maybe you want to elaborate on the story. Yeah, so thank you, Leo. We, we were having that chat, and um, I just you know, want to correlate it to what is incredibly important for founders and entrepreneurs and small businesses. Uh, at, at the time that we're currently going through. Because um, obviously when you're doing this medic training, uh, one of the th first things you learn is whenever you see something, uh, no matter how bad it is, the first thing you should say is, I've seen worse. And um, the reason why you're doing that is not necessarily that you have seen worse before. And obviously most of us will not go through a, a crisis, uh, which is quite at the scale uh, and magnitude as we're currently um, experiencing. But the reason why that kind of single line is important, I have seen worse, is because whether you're injured or whether you're a company struggling or you're an entrepreneur just getting started on your uh, entrepreneurial journey, uh, the mindset in which you kind of tackle this crisis and, and go through the current pandemic is incredibly, incredibly important. You know? Building a business, running a business, owning a business, leading a business in the best of times is challenging. Um, and especially building a, a company from scratch, it's always challenging. Um, you know, some of the world's best entrepreneurs have all experienced this. Uh, if they now run very, very successful businesses, at some point of time, their business almost run out of money. At some point of time, they couldn't get any customers. At some point of time, something went wrong with their product. Everyone experienced these types of things, building a business, whether it's great times or bad times. Um, and only the people who have the right resilience and grit will succeed. Um, and that resilience and grit and belief in yourself uh, is even more important now than it's ever been. Because uh, if you are just entering in your entrepreneurial journey now, or you've built a company for a couple of years, three years, and you just started to get momentum and then this crisis hits you, uh, if you start letting uh, doubt sip into your mind, if you start believing that you will not succeed, uh, that's a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy. So it's just so incredibly important. And we have spent so much time with all of the entrepreneurs and all of that, the portfolio companies, uh, whether, you know, you're in a good situation now and you have to deal with a lot of demand or you're in a situation where all your demands stop to just ensure that uh, you know people have the belief that they will get through it and um, i think that mindset is incredibly incredibly important uh, you know six months ago if you run a small business if you were building a business that was important because you were creating value for yourself your shareholders and your customers Right now, it's an obligation to succeed. If you're an entrepreneur right now, you have an obligation to succeed because not only do you depend on it, but society depends on it, right? Building businesses now, solving real problems uh, will create the employment opportunities, the GDP growth, and you know the path to recovery 
uh, that the world will sorely need coming out of this crisis. Thank you, Magnus. So if you see one single thing that's going to be important to develop as a personal quality uh, pushing through this crisis, what would you say it is? You mentioned quite a few things, but if you should single out one thing that's important for entrepreneurs and, and uh, VCs to have in mind, what would it be? I think uh, the, the most important thing is, is definitely grit. So, you know, stay in power. Uh, like, don't give up uh, because... We don't know how long this will go on for, but the people who get through this, uh, you will learn so much and you will look into kind of a decade's worth of future growth. Um, so it's just so incredible, imp incredibly important to get in the mindset that failure is not, not an option now. Absolutely not an option, no matter what situation you are in as a company. Because if you get through this, you will have learned so much um, you will be in a way kind of stronger position going into the next wave of growth. Um, so I'd say that's number one, agility being a close second. Okay. Lisa, do you have anything else you want to add on from an antler perspective on, on, on that? No, I think, um, I think what we also look for is kind of that drive and having that inner drive where you're not reliant on having other people pushing you or pulling you. This is very much, um, I think, manifested in the situation we are in in Singapore right now when everyone is working from home. We literally don't have anyone around us. It's, it's up to us and our own inner drive to keep going, to keep pushing. And I think that's something we always look for in entrepreneurs, that when they are all by themselves or alone or in co-founder teams, that they can keep going. And I think for every leader and also for every employee, this is extremely important to kind of pull us out of this crisis. Um, that we, uh, we actually do it one by one and individually. And unfortunately for most of us also physically alone um, and that we keep having that inner drive and that inner engine uh, going. Thank you. So Paul, you see this from a bit different perspective where you are pulling businesses from uh, Norway or, or Europe to, to Singapore and, and vice versa. What, what's your take on, on this situation here? Well, um, I think we have to agree with what has been said so far. I sort of think the obvious answer to is that you need both tenacity and, and uh, grit, um, uh, not only under the present market conditions only, but which are you know, obviously quite turbulent to say the least, but in any circumstance, that's important. Hmm. Uh, maybe let me elaborate a little bit where I'm coming from. I don't have a personal experience from uh, building a company, but I do deal with them quite a bit uh, through the Nordic Innovation House, uh, as well as Innovation uh, Norway. Um, I think also it's very important that you manage to communicate the value that you can sort of bring to customers. Uh, and uh, and um, you also need the right teams around you to make that happen. But maybe under the present circumstances, I think that also to have flexibility, to be able to be flexible and agility is important because it's a very changing scenario at the moment. We don't know what the future holds. And so to be able to adjust uh, to whatever comes, change your revenue streams uh, and so on, to think alternatively, I think is also important. Thank you, good. So this one goes to, to, uh, to Antler. When you are, you are meeting and you're seeing a lot of founders coming through your door, stepping through your door and uh, with the concept and with an ID, how long does it take you to define if this is going to fly or not? And, and what are you looking for? Well, so uh, Lisa, you should add in there. But first of all, we're looking at uh, does, does the people themselves, the individual, um, have the grit, the drive, and the spike that is required to be a great entrepreneur. Uh, and then we look at building a strong team around that entrepreneur. So basically finding the right co-founders. Um, and in the end, you know, think about what defines success and what, you know, will define what you start building, whether you'll be successful in building that, whether you will be successful in getting customers, whether you will be successful in growing. It all comes down to that core team. That's where it starts. That's number one. Then the second thing we start looking at is, um, you know, what, what are kind of exciting problems for them to solve? And, and typically those ideas will, will typically come from the founders themselves because, you know, they might've worked in the, uh, you know, shipping industry for a decade and they see in kind of areas to innovate on within the value chain of, of shipping. And, 
And then we kind of go from that broader problem statement and kind of deep dive into something that would solve a real problem for the customers. Um, and uh, if it's a deep tech problem, we look at like how, how can research and innovation kind of drive uh, value from developing this specific technology. If it's a consumer problem, uh, you know, we, we talk with consumers, there are consumers everywhere. Uh, but that kind of validation around the business model is incredibly important. And the best way to validate a business uh, proposition before you even built it is to actually sell it, right? So if you think about the story behind Microsoft, for example, which is one of the first companies to hit the trillion dollar valuation, Bill Gates and his co-founder um, sold the first version of the Microsoft product without having written a single piece of code. They went and they sold the value proposition to their first customer. Then they bought it and they went back and then coded for 24 hours a day for four days and came back and showed them the prototype, right? So that's high level of conviction when it comes to validation of a business model is you can sell it even before you start building. And then obviously most businesses you can't do that with, but you can, you can test it with a lot of customers. You can sign LOIs, you can get feedback, but Hey, if nobody's kind of interested in, you know, interested in, in, in kind of you helping them solve the problem you're trying to solve, then it's probably not a good business. It might still be, but then you need to at least convince yourself and convince investors that it's still worth solving. Uh, so we spend a lot of time on that. And then, Obviously, once you've found the right thing to solve with the right team, uh, you've solved, I think, 70, 80% of the, of, the, of the topic, right? And then it becomes about execution, creating momentum, getting the right investors on board, getting the first customers, getting the product to the market. So that's the process we go through. Um, Lisa, anything to add? No, I think that was, that was plenty. But I think our model is that we have, typically we have a couple of thousand people applying to our programs in different cities. Um, and then we work with the founders for about two, two and a half months before we actually decide which team we will end up investing in. And during those months, we have definitely seen that inner drive and the grit, and of course, a lot of customer validation. So we do know the entrepreneurs fairly well when we make a bet and actually invest into the team. Thank you. So, so being an entrepreneur or operating a venture fund might be described as operating uh, with an extreme sport. How do you ensure that you are physically and mentally ready for each day's battle to secure a long-term viability for the ones having put faith in you? Because there is a high level of stress in this. And will the stress level increase even further post-COVID-19? Yeah, so I think, um, I think first there's an individual part to this, is right? Like finding out how you as a person, you as a leader, uh, can optimize uh, your effectiveness um, as a leader. Um, and there, I think everyone has their own ways of doing it. So for me, it's, you know, a bit of active meditation now and then is important, meaning doing, doing sports. Um, and, and uh, you know, you combine that with, uh, you know, of course, learning, being in constant learning, seeing what's happening around you, seeing what other great people are doing, um, seeing what people are doing in other industries so you can take that and apply it to what you are doing. So that it starts there. Then I think the second part is putting together a team which kind of complements you and shares a common set of values and a common set of passion and mission in terms of what you want to deliver. I think we've, uh, we're, we're quite lucky in, in Andrew to put together, I think, a very diverse group of people, but with a shared value set. Um, and if you have a team like that around you, you can, you can share those challenges that you're approaching every day and you can lean on people who know stuff and have different types of opinions than you do to find the right solution and the right direction. Um, so I think if you have those things in place, uh, you, you're pretty well set up. Now, in terms of, um, you know, stress levels, I think it's, um, you know, building companies and investing in companies is, um, a long-term uh, job. I mean, we, we have a five to 10 year horizon on everything we're doing. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in, you know, situations like this, obviously there are a lot of new things that you need to do. You spend more time ensuring that you can support your portfolio companies through it. Uh, you have some who are struggling with an increase in demand. You have others who are struggling with, you know, going from 
losing 90% of their revenue and you have to deal with these types of topics, but you need to look at it from a five to 10 year perspective. Now it's yes, you got to come through the current crisis, but you got to do it in a way that enables you for the next wave of growth. And I think if you look at it in that perspective, um, you know, you will uh, obviously just shift the way you spend your time in this period of time. And, uh, you know, we look at both opportunities and, and challenges and work on those. Uh, but you also know that it's, you know, just part of, uh, you know, a period towards a longer term outcome. And this, I think, is incredibly important to have that kind of being at the balcony and the dance floor at the same time mentality. So you're there at the dance floor fighting together with your portfolio companies and your founders every day, but you also have the longer term perspective and the strategic perspective of what's going to happen in the next kind of five to 10 years. So I think both of those are important on that level. That I think lowers, lower, lowers the stress level quite a bit. I don't know, Lisa, if, if you have anything to add. No, I think that was great. I think like like having that long-term perspective is, is really important. And that also goes for, for the situation we're in now. And I think one of the first thing Magnus and I said when we spoke to our portfolio companies is that this is not a two week hiccup. This is, this can go on for 12 months, for 18 months, whatever your life situation is right now, make sure it is sustainable and that you can keep going in this, uh, with this kind of routine for a long time. So it was important for us to prepare all the founders in our portfolio that, you know, you gotta, if you don't have a healthy or a sustainable lifestyle today and tomorrow, you gotta change that right now because this will take time and this will continue. Um, and the same thing goes for, for startups uh, generally. Um, I think all VCs know that we have a 10, 10 year fund life, which means that we only know in 10 years from now, whether or not, you know, what companies ended up being successful or not. So that is something that we all kind of need to make every day a sustainable and healthy day. Paul, you, you work on this uh, with a bit different angle, with more contact directly with the governments and the regulators, uh, what have you. How, how do you sense the stress level, both in Singapore and in, in Norway when it comes to, or in Europe, when it comes to the uncertainties? Uh, well, it come, well it, when it comes to the, the uh, VCs, for instance, the venture capital uh, funds and so on, they will obviously be focused on, on um, the survival of their portfolio companies, first and foremost. And obviously, there is some stress in that. Um, then again, there is a, a lot of money around, and, and um, the valuation of startups is uh, somewhat lower now than, than before the crisis. So that is obviously a bonus for them. Um, for startups, um, they obviously need to increase their uh, runway uh, until the crisis is over. Uh, so make sure that they have enough uh, money for that. Uh, uh, on the other hand, sort of for a startup, the market share that they have is typically quite small. It's like 0.0 what percent of the market, so it down. If the market goes down a little bit, then might not necessarily dent their, their um, income that much. So, so I mean, there are, there are uh, obviously stress levels here, but it all depends on how this develops uh, over time. And that is something that is very, very difficult to make any predictions about. Fine. How do you assess the, the, the risk appetite in the global financial markets post this uh, virus uh, episode. You know, thinking about the VCs and possibly a more narrow focus on industries and, and segments that will be able to keep afloat in crisis. Now we have health tech video conferencing and digital connectivity that is have a booming industry and the tourism is, is collapsing. But how much of a refocus would it be within industries to really focus on industries that can survive both up and down turns? Will there be a major shift in, in the financial markets to safeguard capital because of this? Who uh, would like to start, Magnus? I can start. Yeah. So I think, I think in terms of risk and, and appetite, I think what we see from a from our corner of the world, when it comes to startups and, and venture capital firms, I think what we see is that um, we, we kind of see that this still kind of full, full steam ahead, uh, which means that people are still investing. We have lots of our portfolio companies are closing the rounds. Fellow VC firms are still raising big funds. And we also see startups all over the world raising capital right now. We see a big demand for new digital solutions and new software products. 
Um, and I think startup, if you see startup as one major industry, I think Paul talked about the market shares. I think market shares from startups that they are now eating up from more established and, and uh, older and bigger corporations, that is happening. And that is happening at a much, much faster pace than what we saw before. So I think, um, I actually think the entire startup sector has a huge um, advantage, even if it's kind of very sad circumstances. I think this is pushing a lot of change um, in big organizations and in governments and so forth. Okay. Yeah, Magnus, I, th yeah I, th I think it's, it's a great question. And um, um, I think uh, just a few observations, right? It's impossible to kind of completely uh, forecast this, but um, first of all, uh, you will see there's certain industries where you've seen kind of decades worth of change happening in a matter of weeks currently, right? So you have, you know, the education industry, probably there's a bunch of people on the call who have, are now sitting with kids at home, I am, uh, who are doing homeschooling. And uh, yeah, it works pretty well, but it's not great, right? Uh, but, you know, people moved kind of decades worth of, uh, of you know, change in education has just happened in the last couple of weeks as everyone is now going online learning. Uh, however, it's kind of with very basic tools. Now, there's a huge opportunity in that space, right? For example, uh, you know, differences in educational quality. If you can do this better, more effectively online, uh, and you don't need to be at location, you could, you know, people could get a Harvard education from anywhere, really, right? So there, there is kind of you, there's there's a lot you can do within that space to make it way 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 better for people who don't have access to education but also people in more developed market have great access to education health the healthcare market health space right you know um it's just it's just incredible that uh, you know we still spend 80 percent or so of uh, uh healthcare spend is spent on uh, kind of treating diseases where simple changes in lifestyle uh, could have avoided having that disease in the first place. Or if you discovered it early, you would have been able to treat it much more effectively. Uh, while the average person is called probably spends uh, more money uh, maintaining their car every year than they spend in five years maintaining their own health and body, right? So there's, you know, and, and then you see all of the kind of, uh, you see all of the deficiencies in the kind of healthcare space in terms of how they're kind of treating the current pandemic. So there's tons of opportunities. Governments, right? Government technology um, has, take, has grown leaps and bounds uh, over the last few weeks. And manufacturing, supply chain, people are thinking about, you know, how will supply chains work in the future, right? Obviously in Singapore, we see that quite clearly. Singapore being worried about basic stuff as uh, food security, uh, having the, the right kind of supplies for healthcare equipment and et cetera, um, which will lead, I think, to innovation in supply chains and innovation in terms of manufacturing, in terms of agri-tech, food tech, and et cetera. So there's just humongous amount of opportunities uh, in industries that I think will see a tremendous amount of change uh, over weeks or months. Um, I think in terms of venture capital investments, um, you know, 2018 and 2019, the two last year, is the two years where the most amount of capital was raised to invest into to startups and technology companies, uh, excluding the Vision Fund, more than $100 billion. Uh, that capital has not been deployed. So there's kind of ample amount of capital out there that people want to deploy into great companies. Uh, so I think you'll see definitely continued uh, kind of investment cycle. I think only in Antler we've seen eight, 10 of our portfolio companies raised capital the last uh, two weeks from new investors, um, which is exciting to see. However, I think uh, you, you have also have a little bit of a kind of a healthy uh, revaluation here and there. And you also, I think, take away part of that kind of lifestyle entrepreneurship part of the ecosystem, right? Like there, there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there and a lot, who, who, who shouldn't have been kind of entrepreneurs in the first place because they're not really serious and passionate and driven about what they want to accomplish. Um, so, so, so these, these are just some thoughts. Um, uh, and then I think there's, there's a small kind of space of time now, now where people are reevaluating a bit. So they are, you know, some people are still deploying capital, but there are some people who are kind of thinking through uh, how they want to optimize their kind of private versus public, 
you know, portfolio, fixed assets versus non-fixed assets, real estate versus other assets. And, you know, I think there's a small pulse now where people are kind of rethinking that strategy and reallocating, but then we'll start kind of getting into the market again. And I think that uh, venture, if anything, will be uh, an even more attractive category because, you know, there's new opportunities every reason. And at the same time, hey, the only way we can can get back on track after this crisis with, you know, 6 million people applying for unemployment in, in the U.S. every week is by creating new employment opportunities and creating growth. And a lot of that will come from entrepreneurs building and solving new problems. I like your comparison, uh, looking at the amount of money spent looking after a car compared to your own body. So, so thanks for that one. That's something uh, that really will, we will take with us. When we, we think back from January 2020, Asian economies uh, became larger than the rest of the world combined if we measure the PPP or purchasing power parity. Will Asian markets after this crisis bounce back stronger than all other markets globally? Paul, I'll leave this one for you first, if you can take the one. Um, well, if we look at the region that we are uh, presently in, um, one aspect of interest is, is a, sort of in a digitalized world is uh, the internet economy. Um, there is a report written by Temasek and, and Google uh, called Economy Southeast Asia, uh, which sort of looks at the internet economies in six uh, Southeast Asian uh, nations. Uh, Malaysia, Philippines, Indonesia, Thailand, Singapore, Vietnam, I believe. And in isolation, sort of this region has approximately half a billion people. Uh, but the size of the economy uh, is approximately similar to that of Italy. So obviously there is a lot of potential for growth here. Um, and over the past few years, um, there has been a substantial increase sort of in internet access in the region. Uh, and 10 years ago, I think 75% uh, of the population had no internet access and limited sort of uh, access to um, electronic information. Uh, but today, uh, the region is sort of one of the more interesting places with a high internet penetration and, and also uh, sophisticated use of, of internet. And, you know, digitalization being part of the equation when it comes to future growth opportunities. Uh, we're looking at platforms within digital health, we're looking at uh, platforms within uh, edtech, uh, fintech, and so on. Um, I think definitely Southeast Asia will be a very interesting place to be. So all of you have experiences with operating in global markets. Antler, you have office in Europe, US, Africa, and Asia, and the same uh, for Innovation Norway. Do you see any other quantum shifts in terms of industry segments that will grow fast faster than others, either by geographics or within individual countries, where startups and entrepreneurs will have blue oceans of opportunities post the crisis. Magnus? Yeah, I can, I can start. If, yeah, I can start with that one. I think what we see and in terms of blue ocean opportunities, it's, it's more like a trend that is now accelerating. And it's, is a trend of having your team uh, remote. And I think that is, of course, whether we sit at home um, or on the other side of the world, uh, it, it actually doesn't make a big difference and we can still work and collaborate together. So I think, I think we've seen, especially in the startup scene, we've seen a big trend in kind of remote teams and people who are you know, collaborating and working together from all over the world. And it's been fairly small, but we have some, you know, VC funds focusing only on in investing in remote teams. And I think that is something that is now really accelerating. And then what happens when you can have a few people based in San Francisco, you have a few people in the Philippines, in India, in China, and so forth, then you can build a really, really strong team. Um, and, and you can move really, really fast. And I think that is something that we will see um, more of. Um, and that would, of course, impact, I think it will impact a little bit the Bay Area, and I think it will impact the extractiveness and the, you know, the need for being in, in Bay Area. And, and people are now talking about that Silicon Valley is more of a mindset than a physical place. Um, and I think Y Combinator said that now that the next Y Combinator program will be fully remote. Um, so it's, it's a very interesting trend. And, and imagine then what happens when opportunities that were 
you know, you needed an American visa to work for a certain startup. Now you can be in Southeast Asia or in India or in South America, and you can still join that team. You can get access to the equity and what that means for kind of um, the local uh, communities um, around the world. So I think, I think that's a huge trend. And I think technology and products solving the problems that involve in having a payroll with 44 different nationalities and uh, health insurances for 44 different nationalities. Those are big, big opportunities where I think a lot of investments will go into. And I think a lot of great new companies will come out of it. Right. Magnus, Paul, anything else you want to add on? Yeah, no, I, I think in terms of opportunities, you mentioned uh, some of them already. So, you know, healthcare, education, governmental technology, supply chain, manufacturing. I think there we've seen a ton of acceleration and opportunities uh, kind of currently created and pro real problems that, that need to get resolved. Um, and I think a lot of entrepreneurs will jump on that opportunity. Um, I think on top of that, it's just, you know, I think we're still in a space where digitalization is is just, at the margin of happening, right? If you think about it in Southeast Asia, um, it's, you know, we've, we've seen a lot happen in retail. We've seen a lot of happen in logistics and hyper-local delivery. We've seen, uh, you know, marketplaces. Uh, we've seen um, a bit on the payment side, um, but we're really just at the beginning of, I think, uh, revolutionizing almost any industry with technology. And uh, this, I think it was true before, uh, the situation, the crisis, and I think even more true now that we'll see kind of an acceleration in terms of innovation and disruption. Uh, you know, you have dozens of technologies maturing at the same time. We, for the first time, and this has really been shown during the pandemic, we for the first time ever live in a truly global market, right? It took the airplane industry 68 years to get 50 million customers. It took Pokemon Go 14 days to get 50 million customers. It took the pandemic a few months um, to, to obviously infect most of the world. Now, that is, of course, disastrous uh, from a pandemic perspective, but from an economic opportunity perspective, if you find a solution to a real problem, it means that you can export that almost from anywhere to anywhere, which is why you see billion dollar companies being developed, uh, not only in the Valley and in China anymore, but you see it, you know, in in Stockholm and Oslo and Singapore and Sydney um, um, and all over the globe. And I think that will just, just continue um, where obviously some new opportunities have, have arisen. Um, I, I don't see how that will slow down with anything. I think it will, will, will accelerate. So many organizations that have existed for many, many years have unfortunately closed down due to the crisis a crisis that was impossible to foresee coming. So when we move into a new world order post the crisis, what principles from entrepreneurship should traditional organizations adopt to help keep them better positioned against any future severe market disruption? I, I'm happy to jump in first. I, I think it's... Um... I think it's incredibly important to be close to innovation and understand what's going on. And um, uh, that's, I think, is just step number one. And I think actually most uh, great and older businesses know their industry better than anyone else. Uh, uh, but if one doesn't, one will need to kind of really understand what those challenging technologies will be and what technology will do with your business. So I think that's number one, is just understanding. Then the second thing for me is, um, uh, there's, a, there's a tremendous amount of companies that have uh, existed and are still on the top and kind of re-innovated themselves generation after generation after generation. Um, and I think the major learning from them is that they are not afraid to challenge their core, right? It's, it's, it's one of those kind of scariest thing when you run a very successful business and there's an area in which you earn a lot of money. Uh, you're always afraid to kind of innovate too much on that core because by innovating you might reduce margins or you might challenge your own kind of business units right um, however if you don't do that somebody else will do it and i think that's kind of one of the kind of core uh, issues you have if you don't allow yourself to kind of challenge your core and rather take that kind of short-term hit on marginality and profits and revenue uh, by developing a new 
and better product and cheaper way of delivering what, what you can deliver to your customers. Because if you don't do it, then somebody else is going to do it. And I think that's kind of one of the major learnings I've seen in terms of survival is like, don't be afraid of challenging your core and rather take that short term hit on revenue and margins by developing a better and cheaper and more efficient product. Uh, because if you don't do it, somebody else is going to do it and then they're going to completely kill your core business. So, Paul, you have seen a lot of traditional businesses in uh, our home country, Norway, suffering in the past few few weeks and months. And obviously, a lot of it has gone into travel and tourism industry. But what's what's your take on, on, the, on the situation and what could companies possibly have done differently, uh, despite being almost impossible to predict what was happening? Well, it's very, it's a, that's a good question. I mean, obviously, to know what to have done differently is very difficult to prepare for this kind of thing. Uh, but of course, um, we have a, a podcast that we do on a bi-weekly uh, basis. And uh, the first episode we had a few weeks ago, three weeks ago or so, uh, we interviewed a more traditional company, Yara, and as well as Crayon, which is more into the digital and, and uh, cloud space of things. And, uh, and of course, they're affected in very different ways. Um, and they've tried to, 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 you know, approach this challenge in different ways. And they've done so quite well. Uh, um, Yara, for instance, have, uh, have sort of um, shifted, uh, obviously, the way they transport things. They had flexibility in how they do uh, the logistics of things. Uh, suddenly you can get container ships out of China. How do you transport your goods when everything is based on container vessels? Well, you shifted to bulk. Uh, um, you're supposed to run courses for farmers on how to use fertilizer and grow food. Uh, you usually do that uh, in person. Suddenly you have to do it digitally. How do you do that when their technology levels are quite low? We're talking about Thailand, we're talking about India. Uh, so you have to find uh, technological solutions that work. Uh, for Crayon, on the other hand, obviously they are uh, seeing that everyone, every industry is leapfrogging uh, the digital development trajectory uh, under the present circumstances. For them, that's, that's good. But they also need to uh, reinvent themselves to find new revenue streams and so on. And they're doing that by developing new platforms for, for universities and to do long distance uh, training and, and learning and so on. Um, so there are various ways of approaching this depending on what kind of a company you are. Um, and there is no sort of a, a golden recipe, uh, but you know, definitely I think one of the key issues is to be flexible and agile is one of the main learnings to take away. Uh, and so that you're better equipped to, I guess, um, tackle this kind of a, a situation when it arises. So I'm thinking about the trend that might emerge after this uh, crisis and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but if you look at the startups, they have in the past recruited experienced industry leaders to the boards and advisory boards. Could now the tables be turned where established organizations will need more agile and entrepreneurship driven competence on their boards? I can, I can start. Oh, Lisa. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, thank you. So I think um, I've seen this actually for the past you know, quite five, six years, um, having been advising some and, and being close to other advising big corporations uh, in the big, you know, digital transformation and the big technical shifts happening. So I think in, in quite a few organizations, this has already happened. And we've seen like either advisors to the CEO or leadership or board meeting members who have a very solid and strong tech, tech technology background. And I think this will, of course, happen um, at a very at a broader scale now and i think you know those companies who still haven't moved kind of all of their tech and it from on-prem service to the cloud uh, will do so now and i think a lot of these older uh, enterprise software products where people are a bit more locked in you may even need consultants in order to change some part of your core product I think this will now rapidly be changed to people are building out their own technology organizations or using um, available and easy to use SaaS products where everything is on the cloud. And instead of having, and I think that's a good analogy for how to switch your organization as well, instead of having all of your information in one server, in one room, it's now spread out all over the internet in different data centers. And I think that is as an organization and how to be resilient and agile, I think that is 
kind of a good analogy that you're not depending on one or a few individuals and, and people, but kind of responsibility and the work is spread out through a distributed organization. So you can keep going, even if some people fall, fall ill or become sick for a long period of time or need to care for their children or family members that you can still kind of continue going. And I think that is a lesson that a lot of organizations are now kind of learning, um, including ourselves and how we are, you know, dividing and conquering and, and kind of continue moving ahead. So it, it's basically impossible for us to have this discussion that we now have and talk about the future of the world and what the world might look like without talking about China. Will China in the long term be the winner, both financially, tech-wise and innovation-wise, given China's focus on within the legal framework to gather big data on individuals, habits and trends, which is done on a scale that no other nation can organize. Paul? Uh, well, <laughs> if the premise is correct, uh, that uh, there is sort of no way of returning to a sort of a pre-COVID-19 world, which is, I guess, what the conclusion for most of us is gradually, um, then that premise sort of raises several uncomfortable questions about sort of the nature or the characteristics of, of this change. And uh, obviously for, for um, individuals or families or communities and so on, uh, life has changed profoundly. But if you look at sort of the government nation level, uh, that sort of uh, also makes it quite interesting. Um, there is obviously examples of countries that wouldn't typically collaborate that much together, collaborating under the present circumstances. Obviously the need for multilateral solutions, collective solutions is quite clear. Um, but then of course there is also the risk that uh, the crisis might lead to world leaders or governments actually getting more divided. Um, and, uh, and the US and the EU are examples of, of this latter situation. Um, now you mentioned the, the sort of the shift from west to east, um, uh, and I think sort of the if you you know look at Europe and America and the way that they've sort of um, uh, approached this crisis and tried to, to solve it, it's been quite slow and disorganized uh, in general. Um, I'm not sort of talking about the entire continent of Europe, of course. Nordics being an example of, of uh, a successful, I would say, rather successful way of solving it. Um, but uh, America and the rest of Europe, some of them are, are not dealt with it very well, meaning that the brand of the West is sort of tarnished a little bit. And this was already uh, sort of weakened uh, after the or following the financial crisis in 278 and so on. Uh, so um, China obviously had some issues initially with uh, the way they tackled it, you know, suppressing information and so on. But then after a while they came around and now they're sort of offering uh, assistance to Italy and other countries that are sort of in a need, sort of strengthens their brand. It's become sort of a, uh, an issue for them to promote a sort of a soft power approach, which is not something that they've been very good at usually. Um, if you disregard obviously investments and, and aid in Africa. Um, but, um, if the US doesn't come around to sort of change that narrative, um, I think that um, China might use the occasion to set new rules according uh, uh, to its own understanding of uh, or perceptions of global governance. And uh, that might not be in the interest of smaller countries that sort of rely on multilateral structures to reinforce their sort of place in the world. Um, and how that will affect the startup segment of things is uh, anyone's guess but that politics and nationalism might become even stronger components in business could be one consequence, of course. Sure. So the, uh, the USA have continuously unsubscribed to globalization uh, principles. How will this in the long term impact entrepreneurship and VCs? I initially thought to narrow this question down on Singapore and Norway, but now we have so many participants coming in globally, both from Africa and, and uh, the Americas. So if anyone can answer that question holistically from a global perspective, uh, Magnus, would, uh, would you have an aim on that one? Yeah, well, so I, I think that um, for, for a very long time, uh, a lot of innovation and a lot of entrepreneurship and a lot of kind of global platforms um, have kind of consistently been built out of the US. And I think 
even before the crisis, we started seeing these types of platforms being built from other locations. Um, you know, for example, I think the best known example is obviously ByteDance and uh, TikTok out of China, which is, I guess, the biggest kind of software success coming out of out of China. And, and now it's, of course, incredibly popular all across the globe. Um, but you also have kind of B2B SaaS companies like Atlassian coming out of Sydney. You have Spotify coming out of Stockholm. These are, you know, $20 billion businesses. Uh, you also have regional businesses like, you know, Basal, I guess now is 6.5 billion. C Group uh, was almost 20. I'm not sure what it is now uh, after the market collapse. But this, this, this is already happening, and I think it will continue to happen. And I think, um, obviously, what is going to be important for the U.S. is continue to be a location where they attract some of the world's, uh, you know, most exceptional individuals uh, to, to work and help grow great companies. If you think about a lot of the kind of best companies in the U.S. have actually been built by first or second generation immigrants. So if, if that stops, that kind of talent attraction stops and you're not able to kind of go there and work anymore, it's obviously going to have an effect on their ability to innovate. Um, uh, while at the same time, you know, countries like Singapore, many places in Europe, uh, many pl other places in Asia are really kind of becoming attractive hubs uh, for those really exceptional people. And if you combine kind of local talent with global talent, uh, you can create, uh, you know, really amazing companies. I think that that openness is going to be important in the U.S. Um, and I think it's going to be important for anyone who wants to be a global entrepreneurial hub because you need to attract, uh, you know, uh, a diverse group of entrepreneurs. And, you know, that's why I think the enterprise solution, for for example, in Singapore has been so successful is because you combine the very best Singaporeans with, with great people from across the globe. Um, so I think that's that's going to be important. Now, I think, you know, back to, to, it was this question, but also the former question, I think what I would love to see going forward is is also, you know, a strengthening of international organizations and institutions. I think what we missed a little bit in this crisis um, is uh, a strong UN, a strong World Health Organization. You can set a global agenda and uh, uh, and help lead the world, right? Which is typically a role that either they took or the US took. Uh, and there's a bit of a vacuum there right now that hopefully, uh, you know, the world will wake up and see that that is needed. So we have we have quite a few startups uh, with us today, and uh, all of you are working with uh, startup companies both in Asia and in Norway and America and the Africa markets. If you, for example, see one company uh, within the startup scene succeeding in Norway, will that company have an equal chance of success in Asia? Lisa or Magnus? I mean, I can see from, um, I think Norway and Singapore, Sweden uh, have an advantage in being a very small home market, which means that if you are serious uh, about building a startup and you want to build, uh, you want to bring in venture capital, it means that your, whatever you have today needs to be worth probably 10, 50 times as much in just a couple of years. It means that you need scale. And Norway is just too small for scale. And so is Singapore and so is Sweden. So what we see a lot of these successful startups coming out of these countries have actually built for a global audience from day one. They may try it at their home market and then they go global very quickly. Um, and, and that's how they then become successful. Um, if you need to take a, one country at a time, it will take a long time uh, to reach kind of that big scale that you typically do need in order to have a startup as compared to just any small business um, that has a kind of a different growth um, growth uh, targets. Um, so I think it's sure you could do it. You should do a test in your home market market. And if that is successful, then why not launch globally? I think my background is a lot in mobile apps. And I think we've seen the last quarter was the best quarter ever. Uh, revenues went up 20% globally. People are downloading, people are paying for apps. And if you develop an app, why should you only make it available in one country? Then you cannot go global from day one. And we see that um, among most of our startups that they are definitely having that kind of global hat on um, and making their products available to anyone uh, everywhere. Hmm. 
So I'm uh, cautious of the time. We have a few minutes left, uh, but uh, I think we have a good discussion. So we're going to push it a little bit beyond time frame, if that's okay for everyone. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Singapore, Singapore as a destination for entrepreneurs and VCs. What is the big pull factor uh, for anyone coming to Singapore? Um, we have uh, participants in this uh, webinar from uh, all over um, the world. So, Magnus, do you want to start the way you've seen it? Because you, you, you built it from scratch. So you have been a part of uh, the journey. Yeah, I mean, uh, the pull factor is, is, is many. Brown by an economy is, uh, you know, consistently grown 6-8% per year over the last decade. It's one of the most stably growing economies across the globe, fastest growing middle class in the world, fastest growing digitalization the world has ever seen. Uh, you can serve, if you look at only Southeast Asia, you can serve 600 million customers from one location. Uh, you can, uh, if you look at, if you take India and China on top of that, that's 2.5 billion. If you look at recruiting talent, obviously, um, Singapore is a great place to recruit talent to. You also have this kind of very hubs around you where you can build tech centers in Vietnam, business outsourcing centers in Philippines. You can build, uh, you know, terrific other types of services in, in Indonesia and Malaysia. Um, uh, on top of that, you have, uh, you know, great rule of law, access to capital. I think only venture capital uh, was more than $2 billion or so. I think it was more than that, it was $10 billion was invested in kind of venture capital and technology here in Singapore last year. Um, plus, you know, it's easy to incorporate a company and, and get everything in place. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a great place to build for, uh, but to Lisa's point, you can't build for the Singaporean market. You either need to build regionally or globally, um, which I think it's a great proposition to have as an investor, uh, as a founder, because that, that you need to think internationalization from day one. Hmm. So I, I would like to take one question from uh, one of the participants. I am uh, young, I'm 22, and I'm an inexperienced, aspiring entrepreneur. How should I stand out or what do I need to do to stand out and be noticed? I think we touched a bit upon that in our first question, but if there's anything else to add on, please, uh, please do. I can add quickly. I think now is actually a great time to get in front of people from from all over the world there is um we are right now having this webinar where you can just dial in and you know everyone on this call you mentioned from so many different countries are coming together and it's easy um we see a lot of organization now hosting a lot of super interesting content and live sessions just like this one it's no longer needed to get an airplane ticket and an expensive hotel to join a conference you can join a conference from your bedroom and I think that is huge and that is really democratizing who can who can mingle with who who can who can get inspired by who um, so now is a great time to be inexperienced in 22 and I think you're quickly going to get very experienced I think you can get into the room with very interesting and experienced people you can also uh, you know have a video chat no, no travel is required no money and investment uh, is, is required and there is so much to learn um, and so much to do. Also, if you do create something on your own, the, you know, everyone is looking for great content now. We're all tired of Netflix and we're looking for, you know, a great next blog post, a great video on, on YouTube. So, so people are consuming content right now at a, at a very, very, you know, I think it's probably more content. I mean, the internet is going down in Europe because, you know, everyone is screaming so much. So it is a great time. Um, to do f things um, and, and to be inexperienced in 22 uh, it is actually a really, really good time. Plus, you probably don't have kids. I mean, you have even more, even more time to, do a to learn and to create. I, I just kind of, uh, on top of what Lisa said, which I think is very true, just kind of very kind of rapid fire advice. So A, you know, I think just decide to do it. That's the most important step. Decide that now you're going to, you know, build a business, do that. B, um, you know, think through everyone around you. Uh, if there are people you know, people you're excited about, people you've seen, people you met that could be a good co-founder so you can put together a strong team, then iterate that business model. In parallel, write down 50 names, the 50 most exciting people you know all across the globe. You might not know them and then try to get in contact with them somehow. And then 50 people more in your local community that you respect and look up to and try to get in contact with them. And then tell them, 
about your vision and your passion and about what you want to accomplish and ask if they want to help you on that journey. And I promise you, if you do that, you're going to come out of it with a, you know, an exciting idea, the beginning of a team and some very, very strong supporters. Like these things just doesn't happen by themselves. It requires kind of hard work, grit, hustle, just go out there and get it done. And if we can help, go to antler.co and just click apply. And we're still accepting a bunch of entrepreneurs that we help every day. So uh, also hope, hope, hope to, to be able to help out. So I want to take one more question from, uh, from the audience. And that is, um, how would you as an entrepreneur raise investment under the current scenario or the current uh, situation with the virus? Um, uh. I, I, I can, so very very quickly um again right write on the list of 50 to 100 investors you're excited about and uh if you don't if you can't create a list that is that long then you know write the, the longest list you can and then start reaching out to people and then your business will probably be in kind of one out of a few different categories either you are in survival mode meaning your business stopped for a period of time and you need to get runway in which case you need to explain how your business is going to be amazing as we get out of the crisis and that this is just a short term period so you're, it's more like a bridge round right and uh, but you're really well set up for coming out of it or you're in kind of a pivoting phase where you can talk about hey we learned so much about this crisis we're not pivoting and this is our product it's going to be amazing and explain why or you are kind of benefiting from the opportunities that the current environment create and in which case you need to kind of very clearly show that but yes it's a combination about just getting in front of these people and then coming with a compelling story right and nothing has really changed we see portfolio companies raise uh, almost every day uh, that are part of antler and uh, uh, you know again it's just about doing it yeah, yeah. So i mean just do yeah now is a now is a great time for startups um, and just keep you know, don't let this uh, distract you um, and, and kind of keep going. And I think investors are still investing a lot of capital and, and there is a, it is actually a great time for building great software uh, products. So there are like no excuses and, and people are taking a lot of calls um, over video and a lot of meetings and getting to know each other and, and making big investments. So we don't really see, um, you know, any, any signs that the world would be slowing down. Um, in the startup corner of the world. Fine. So I think that's uh, bringing us to, to an end. I would uh, like to thank everyone that has participated in this webinar globally. It's, uh, it's great to get connected with so many new people. I hope you will all remain connected to NBUS. Please go to nbus.org.sg where you can uh, subscribe and, and get connected with us. And we will send you updates on all the uh, webinars and podcasts which are coming up. And I thank Antler and Innovation Norway for the partnership in this event. Anything you want to add on, uh, Magnus, Lisa, Paul? Well, um, maybe I could just add one one thing towards the end. We've been talking, I mean, obviously there's a lot of cash going around like we sort of asserted, but there is also some government support schemes in Singapore and also in Norway and around the Nordics that people should look into. A lot of it is related to innovation and starting up new business. And um, we are also partnering up with uh, Asia Development Bank Ventures. We're also partnering up with UNDP to uh, try to mobilize companies, startup companies with specific solutions to challenges in the region. Um, and there is a runway for companies that place too, in addition to obviously uh, VCs and so on. So um, just wanted to, to make that point. So anyone interested can contact you uh, directly, Paul? Sure, go right ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, Lisa, you looked like you had one. Thing to add was no right? i was just nodding that was a great that was a great addition by paul <laughs> yeah very very good okay but then we uh, we thank you all for joining the uh, nbus uh, talk series and uh, look forward to meet you again one day soon thank you thank you leo thank you paul thank you lisa thank you thank everyone, you, everyone.